Hi, welcome to History Respond. I'm your host, Bob Whitaker. On today's episode, we're looking at Isonzo, the latest entry in Black Mill's First World War game series. Like previous games in this series, Isonzo offers, in the words of the developers, an authentic World War I first-person shooter, this time set in the mountainous campaign between the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and the Kingdom of Italy. So you might be wondering, just how authentic is this experience? And furthermore, how does this game add to the surprisingly growing library of games on the First World War? To answer that question, I've invited onto the show two guest historians. First is our old friend, Chris Kempshaw. Dr. Kempshaw, who should be somewhere running around uh, on these fields, <laughs> uh, is a research <laughs> fellow at the University of Exeter and historian of the First World War. He also studies the representation of history and conflict in modern media. His most recent book is on the history and politics of Star Wars, Death Stars and Democracy, which was published this year by Rutledge. More importantly, Chris was a History Respawn guest for our episodes on Battlefield One and Black Mills Tannenberg. Chris, welcome back to History Respawn. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, I have no doubt that I'm going to die many, many times. <laughs> well, I've in, just been shot. Uh, the, the coming game. <laughs> this is. Uh, I haven't of... seen any bad guys yet. Oh. And by bad guys, automatically, I'm moving into a good and evil <laughs> form of uh, <laughs> the game, which is dubious. Um, and then also joining us on today's show is Dr. Vanda Wilcox, who is a historian of the First World War in Italy. Her books include Morale in the Italian Army in the First World War, published by Cambridge University Press in 2016, and The Italian Empire in the Great War, published by Oxford University Press in 2021. She has taught at universities in Paris and Rome and now lives in Milan. Vanda, welcome to History Respond. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and also just about this game in general. Great. Uh, so uh, my first question is for Chris. You know, we've covered um, some of Black Mill's other games. We did an episode on Tannenberg, which came out, you know, maybe four or five years ago at this point. And so now we've got a new um, First World War FPS multiplayer game. And I'm wondering, Chris, are there too many First World War games now? Um, I'm going to say not for me, but that's predominantly because I've got rent to pay. Um, and uh, the more games, the the better, as far as I'm concerned. Um, what I think is interesting is the extent to which these games have not stopped after the the centenary. Um, so I don't know if we have too many of them. I'm, I'm pleased that there are more that are being developed since the centenary finished. Um, oh, just give me one second. I have to shoot someone. Um, <laughs> and I'm bleeding out. Um, so I don't think there are. I think oh. it's. Oh, I died. Um, but that's right. It gives me a chance to turn the sound down. Um, no, I don't think there are too many. I think that, yeah, the, the, the way that they're being kind of closed in. And so you know, it does look like Black Mill have largely kind of cornered the first person shooter market mm -hmm. and other games are kind of branching out in, in different and fun directions, which, yeah, I think is, is probably a good thing. Yeah, it's remarkable to me that these games have, you know, continued to build an audience. You know, you think about when Verdun came out, um, I think back in 2014, so right around uh, the beginning of the centenary. And thinking, oh, this is nice. This is a fun little addition to the kind of growing um, game publications on the First World War, which at that point was maybe a handful, really, uh, that you would consider to be worth worth playing at all. And now they've got this third game that's come out. And um, I think it just speaks to how compelling uh, the First World War apparently is uh, for many players. And I'm sure the centenary helped that to a greater degree. But... Uh, Still, something that is is very surprising uh, to me as as a historian and a player. Uh, so, Vanda, yeah, I, oh, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say I don't think kind of any of us would have predicted that we'd end up with you know games like Tannenberg or games like Isonzo in twenty fourteen. It didn't it didn't seem plausible. It's been very interesting to see that as they 
try to keep games going in the First World War and create interest, what that means is moving away from the Western Front and from some of the very traditional ideas of what the First World War is all about, because you can't keep going over the same ground. And so actually that's pushed a, a much broader vision of what the First World War is all about, I think. Yeah, so Vanda, I was wondering if you could speak on that a bit, because um, you know, I'm a historian with a PhD in European history, but I would be hard pressed to come up with any major details related to the Italian front <laughs> during the First World War. Um, I'm embarrassed to say, and you know, I, I kind of feel like, um, you know, obviously when you're talking about the First World War, it's the Western Front that get most of the attention from scholars, and then also from uh, kind of armchair experts and historians. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, could you give us kind of a brief background on the Italian front during the First World War? Who were the participants? What is going on? What is the fighting like? Um, and I will be taking studious notes uh, while you talk. Sure. Well, I mean, it is the kind of neglected front in a lot of ways, or it has traditionally been, which is one of the reasons why this game is, is kind of interesting to me to see the wider public starting to learn about this theater of the war. Um, one of the reasons that I think Italy gets a bit neglected is the shadow of the Second World War, that people think of Italy as a kind of a military disaster. So Italy doesn't join the war in 1914. Uh, it joins in 1915. And it has abandoned its old alliance. Italy started out in 1914, allied with Germany and Austria-Hungary. It decides to switch and it allies itself uh, with the Entente. And it declares war on Austria-Hungary with the hope of uh, conquering these bits of territory in their borderlands, which Italy continues considers to be Italian. So it's very much a war for conquest of territory um, on the Italian front. Uh, and uh, you see from the game, the kind of territory they're fighting through, uh, you might not think that's particularly worth conquering. That's a, another debate worth having. <laughs> but um, there are two major uh, cities, Trento and Trieste, which are their uh, key objectives and which they consider uh, sh should belong to Italy. So that's the objective of the war starting out in 1915, is to capture these lands that still belong to Austria-Hungary and incorporate them into the kingdom. And most people, if they know about it at all, only really know about it insofar as some of the legacy of the war uh, kind of leads into fascism and the rise of fascism afterwards. Mm. Yeah, I could see where the shadow of the Second World War could play a big part in how the war is interpreted on the Italian front. And, uh, you know, you'd mentioned the kind of scenery, I'm going to do something dumb and I'm just going to stand on a hillside facing away from the battlefield. Um, <laughs> you just look at these amazing vistas uh, that they've incorporated uh, into the yeah. game. And, you know, you say this is not maybe land that's worth fighting over. Um, I don't know. I, I would... Uh, would feel these beautiful scenes are worth trying to capture, but maybe not with tens of thousands of lives. Yeah, if you're a peasant farmer and you come up here and you're like, why would we want this bundle <laughs> of rocks? You know what I mean? They didn't know yet that they were going to make ski resorts up there. Um, nowadays, you can do ski tours of the battlefield if you travel there in winter, which is kind of a fun, if scary thing to do. Oh, sure. Wow. Um, um, no, it's. I mean, it's incredibly beautiful, and this is one of the, the great virtues of the game. It's it's uh, it's very accurate. There's a lot of comments from Italians who live in these frontline areas, going, "Oh my goodness, it's so weird. It's like, you know, it's just like outside my front window." You know, so in that sense, it's. Um, <laughs> Oh, to have that kind of view just outside your yeah. front window. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a very beautiful part of the world, but it's a very terrible part of the world to fight it, you know, but in different ways than the Western Front. You know, you think of the Western Front, mm -hmm. you think of mud and Flanders and this low, flat ground. And obviously the, the problems and the experience up here in the mountains are completely different. In the Western Front, you were not very likely to get killed by avalanches, for example, but that's a real problem here. Um, <laughs> Uh, and landslides, if you fire a lot of shells at uh, splintery rock, unsurprisingly, it sometimes uh, collapses down on you. Um, and you get sort of horrible injuries caused by shells hitting mm. these little friable bits of rock that splinter and fly through the air and hit you in the face mm. and stuff. So um, the, the nature of the fighting is, um, I mean, all First World War fighting is grim, but it's grim in its own unique ways, mm. um, thanks to this landscape up here. Right. Uh, so you can see here I've got the kind of officer menu 
pulled up here, they've got a uh, call-in box uh, where uh, if you are playing as an officer character, you can call in support, and that includes artillery, uh, chemical, uh, or aviation. So I've called in recon, and then uh, bromide gas, uh, and dropped it onto the flare that I fired off earlier. So if you were to go up to here, up to the top, and hopefully I won't be shot, you can see that there's a gas cloud, green gas cloud, that appears over here, just in front of me. Um, and so uh, this is this was incorporated in Verdun and Tannenberg, but I feel like the, the kind of animation uh, that they've used for this is a lot better. Um, you know, it's, it's much improved actually, you know, over the course of the past decade when they've been making these games. And so if you were caught into one of these uh, gas fields, you've got to quickly put on your mask. So there's kind of a very, uh, there's a great sense, I think, of material culture in these games, yeah. in the sense that it takes a long time to reload your weapon. Uh, you know, if you're yeah. caught in a gas field, you've got to put on your gas mask or you'll die. Uh, if you do survive the first shot from an enemy, then you have got to, uh, you know, put on a bandage or you're going to bleed out. So on the one hand, that kind of experience, I think, adds to the historical accuracy, but... Also, uh, it's this is not everybody's cup of tea. You know, gamers are used to a rather easy experience when it comes mm -hmm. to playing games, and this game very much does not offer that kind of experience. I think it can be frustrating. It's, I've been reading a lot of, of comments, and I think that that's actually quite interesting that it's, a, it's kind of a choice to make it a sometimes frustrating experience. And I guess the developments team has to run a very fine line between making it so frustrating that you don't want to play and so kind of arcadified that it's completely lost any sense of I don't know if realism is the right word but it's lost any connection with those more authentic elements mm -hmm. well Chris uh, what do you make of this I mean are World War games are they are they not fun to play? Um, do you think that that helps or hurts them? What what do you make of this? I think discussion? it depends a little bit on on how good you are at them. Um, <laughs> you know, there's there's been a variety of very well selling um, first world war games that I have not enjoyed because I am bad at the game. Um, uh, I think that a big selling point for these games is often the fact that they are difficult and they kind of appeal to that kind of ego desire of the player to be to be good at it mm -hmm. and to be good at it doesn't mean you know jumping around constantly with a submachine gun under each arm and a you know a fistful of hand grenades or something like that and basically being you know computer rambo um that people like the kind of the you know the ouch i just got shot um <laughs> the i should just mention the, you did just kill me uh, actually, really? I was trying did. to figure out whether or not we were actually in the same game because no, I haven't We are not, you. and you murdered me. So when you say that <laughs> I should just get good at First World War games, then yeah. You... Or, or just ever so slightly better than me, which <laughs> it's not a big jump. Um, oh, God, it's yeah, it, this war is difficult. Um, and... It is. I'm so bad at this, just astonishingly bad at this. That's why I'm not playing it. It distracts me too much, so I kind of panic. Like, ah. <laughs> There's a, there's a lot of people who are very angry and they want to shoot me and you know i get enough of that at work <laughs> gosh that's dark uh <laughs> well it's a first world war game it is um what i've learned from this game is that if i'd been in the first world war i would almost certainly have been executed for accidentally wandering off in the wrong direction quite unintentionally well and that that's a part of this game so i'll uh i yeah. will just jump over here and so we can give that's why i didn't find anybody at the beginning i mistook what the front line was and started wandering <laughs> perpendicular to the front line and just uh, kind of disappeared off the side of the map yeah which is actually quite realistic like there's a number of first-hand accounts of people getting up to the front line in the so mountains this is not like the western front three seconds right? yeah, and i'll see. be executed you'll be executed so i love this instead of just you know these unsinking you or whatever uh -huh. um or saying this zone is not available. This is brilliant because this is this, um, you were executed for desertion, right? So this is this great reference. I'm sorry, I'm probably overly enthusiastic about historical execution. This is a great <laughs> reference to uh, the, the Italian army's actual disciplinary practices. They executed more of their own troops uh, than any other, certainly any other Western army, than any other army that we have numbers for um, in the First World War. 
predominantly for desertion, but also for a variety of other reasons. Officially, they executed 750 men, but it's probably more like about 1,200. Um, That's and, any table you want to be at the top of. Uh, yeah. So the fact that the, the dev team have incorporated this in this quite interesting way is what happens if you wander outside of the game zone, I think is a, a nice touch, if I can say that, about... Execute. I don't. I thought it was a really interesting way to deal with this in-game problem with a kind of historical reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But also the fact that it's not immediately obvious where the front line is necessarily, or where you're supposed to be going, I found very interesting because that's a real feature of mountain warfare that it's not sort of straight lines of trenches as it mm -hmm. might be on the Western Front, that it's really clear exactly what's going on. That level of real confusion and of the battlefield as this very disorientating space is also something that I think um, comes across in a lot of first-hand accounts of, uh, of Italian soldiers. So I thought that that kind of replicated quite well the sense of confusion that, that many real soldiers had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can see uh, we are... Uh we are in the uh, kind of a squad selection uh, map screen here, Chris, on my screen. And uh, we've got uh, our white troops uh, going up and you can see the where they're supposed to be attacking this kind of little villa uh, just on the hillside. And uh, but you can see, you know, what you were talking about, Vanda, you know, all these kind of narrow paths they've got to follow. And it's a bit like a maze going through there. You don't know really where you are. You just have a general sense of a direction. But then otherwise, you're kind yeah. of in this miasma of either man-built trenches or uh, just kind of natural rock formations that right. make things very difficult. And I, I, I enjoy that as a player. You know, I, I like to hear that it's historically accurate, but I can say as a player, I enjoy that because uh, it makes it more exciting. You know, I think when you're talking about um, kind of Black Mill's previous games, Tannenberg or Verdun, those are kind of open fields um, where you have a very clear sense of where the enemy is, uh, but then also uh, you don't have much natural cover. Uh, but here you've got natural cover, which makes it so that you could perhaps live longer uh, if you're not as bad at the game as I am. Uh, but then also, uh, you know, it gives you an opportunity to be surprised by where the opponent yes. can show up. For sure. And a guy just literally surprised me and jumped out in front of me, which was a delight. <laughs> um, and some of the people, when they die, scream and just scream and scream and scream. And it's really unsettling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If we were to go to one of the other uh, battlefields, which we might do here, I think I'm about to lose. But uh, you can see, uh, again, kind of in terms of material culture, you can see, uh, you know, blown apart bases, uh, clothing and uh, materials strewn across the battlefield and then of course dead bodies dead horses I've dead seen, horses I've seen the horses are levels. kind of upsetting somehow. yes yes i know um okay here we go this is uh best accuracy uh hookem 1883 that's me well done uh, then and then chris won mvp that's for the fun. match so congratulations chris there you okay. go it was it's much easier just being the defender because I just kind of stood and shot Austrians as they came running up the hill. Oh no, actually it Italians as Italians. they came running up the hill. Italians, yes. Um, it is interesting. I've, I've turned down the game volume here, but uh, speaking of Italy, uh, the it, it appears to me that some of the game audio and music uh, includes opera. Uh, I, th yeah. I think I've heard a little Puccini in there, maybe some Verdi. I, I'm not sure. I, you yeah. know, it's been a while since I've been to the opera, but I, I'm for sure... I've heard some operatic music to go along with this. Yeah, the, I, I really like the soundtrack. The soundtrack is, is quite interesting. You've got these very gruesome sound effects of people dying on the one hand and the wounded making horrible noises. And then there's some really very beautiful, quite operatic um, music playing in the background. So it's a bit of a strange <laughs> contrast. <laughs> So here um, we've got a loading screen, which gives you a little bit of historical uh, context. And unfortunately, it goes so fast. You can't read it. You yeah. can't read it, which is, I, I think, disappointing. And I don't think, I meant to look, there's not an option in the options screen to go and look at that historical material. So I suppose... You have I to try and read like a sentence at a time each time. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. It keeps you coming back and loading it in again for I more. suppose you're right. I suppose you're right. Um, so this 
uh, screw, screw this section, this bit of the battlefield at Monte Tengio is very interesting um, because the actual real life owners of Monte Tengio uh, have suddenly decided that they would have liked to have some money for their fortress being in the game. Even though they knew he was knew that the team were doing it and they allowed them access, suddenly they've decided that they would want to have some kind of cash, uh, and so they've started kicking up a fuss about. I don't quite know how the representation of their fortress should have mm. not been. In, I don't know. Interesting. That's interesting. So this is the fortress here, interiors. Yeah. And uh, again, some of the material culture. We've got some, I suppose, supplies here. Some barrels, some boxes. Uh, some sacks from Rome. I don't. I don't know what that is. Yeah, that says wheat flour. Wheat flour. Thank you. Yes. So. Yeah. So the the Italian soundtrack is very good. Um, a lot of Italians are very happy about this because traditionally the dubbing of the voices and so on is, is often done quite badly or there's really awful accents and instead they've got real Italian voice actors and the the shouting on the battlefield and so on is all real. It's all very very well done uh, and these little details. Um, they've put a lot of attention into that level of authenticity to the point that the main complaint that Italians have been making about this is that there ought to be more swearing and more blasphemy from the soldiers <laughs> because that would make it more realistic. Right. Nice. Yeah, but here we are still in the fort. We can look at all the papers. Um, you know, we've got... Yeah. Uh, I saw pocket watches. I know at certain uh, officer stations there are pipes that are included. Um, so it's yeah, it's nice little touches but, like that make you yeah. The kind material of feel... culture is obviously um, something that the team have put a lot of focus on, but it definitely contributes to that feeling of sort of immersivity and of being in mm -hmm. a real place. Mm -hmm. So let's see if I can actually find my way out of this fort. I'm a little lost. We've got some. Well, I got wine. tangled in barbed wire and executed for desertion. So if you do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, the other thing about the fortress is, again, it's a part of um, First World War combat that many people wouldn't necessarily expect. Mm -hmm. uh, both Italy and Austria-Hungary built a whole network of fortresses along their borders between about the 1880s and 1914. Um, and, and look, the war loan poster. That's I know. I was trying to get a look at it and then I got shot in the back. So apologies. Um, my only doubt is that I think we're supposed to be 1916, and I had a feeling that was a 1917 war loan poster. Oh, well, there we go. It's I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Unforgivable sin there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can get loaded back in. It says four seconds. The little details like that, I think, are... Um, you know, I don't know how many players notice them. I notice them, and for me, they're very exciting. But maybe a lot of people are just sort of charging past and shooting each other in the head, and they don't really care. Uh, it's interesting that it, it seems to matter to the team who've produced the game to, mm -hmm. to kind of embed this level of detail. I like to imagine they've got a picture of you set up next to the development suite vendor, and they're like, let's make a, a computer game for this person. <laughs> well, they've done a great job. So here we've got another section of the complex here with some uh, flags and then some uh, Fiat trucks uh, and, uh, I th you know, and some uh, munitions. It's uh, it's nice. And we've even got a few flowers here. This is lovely. Some poppies, um, which I yeah. actually I don't know if they grow in in the Alps. I, I, but, I think they do. Yeah, do they? OK. Oh, here's a phonograph. Uh, some more wine, some records. Uh, what else? We've got some tin cans, some cards. Trying Lots to see if there's grandpa, any more brandy. Yeah, some more uh, propaganda posters. I don't see any. I don't know how useful propaganda actually is when you're already at the front. I don't know if that's. <laughs> that's yeah, I should that. join the army. Oh wait, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lucky for me, I'm already here. Um, yeah. So let's see if I can get back out and get to the fighting. I very briefly made it into the fort, and then unfortunately. Was not welcome with open arms. Oh, no. Gotcha. And not gotcha. by that guy. Oh, you got me. <laughs> I had to get some Excellent. revenge. Oh, I'm being shot. Probably from one of your... I just drive machine gun up here, so... So one thing I thought is quite interesting is that the game definitely seems to be marketed and primarily presented from the Italian point of view. It's called Isons, or not Socha, which is actually what the river would be called nowadays. And, uh, you know, it's the Italian front. It's, it's, it seems that, obviously, you can play either side, but it seems, 
I don't know. My impression is that the Italian side is more uh, kind of the default side, perhaps. Yes. I feel like I've noticed that as well in the marketing. And I'm not sure maybe, I mean, because, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Black Mill is a Dutch developer. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I, I maybe they have more players that are in Italy. Um, you know, it's, it's curious to me. Because I would assume, you know, German, German speaking players, Hungarian players might find this compelling, but I just don't know what kind of market there is for that. I think part of the problem is the breakup of the Austro Hungarian Empire means that there's so many different successor states, mm -hmm. none of whom look back to Austria Hungary <laughs> as a great moment in their history, right? So, Absolutely. You know. Whereas there are people, whereas certainly Italians who are excited to play this for very kind of patriotic reasons, uh, I don't think you're going to get so much of that on the other side. Plus they lost, right? Which is always more of a downer. Yes. Um, oh. But it is interesting in, in terms of how it's presented for the international audience, right? If you're an American or a Brit playing this game, it, it's kind of implicitly putting you into an entente frame of mind that's true that's a great point I, although i don't know how many players would actually be aware of that and you know i i think there is some historical material in this game you know in terms of the loading screens that include uh, original historical photographs yeah. but if they load so quickly that you can't see them it doesn't matter that they're there mm -hmm. um this is kind of a big problem with historical game studies is you know, when we look at these games as scholars, we kind of assume in our writing that everybody is looking at these games the same way we are, you know, because kind of nursing really all of the historical material that's in it. Yeah. But really, uh, how, mu how much are they actually reading this historical material that's available? How many actually see the propaganda posters or look at them in the mm -hmm. way that we do? I yeah. And can read them. And can read them, that too, right? Well, this is what's interesting to me then, because why are developers so interested in putting in this kind of very granular historical detail if it's really only i mean i don't think they care about what we think sadly so <laughs> <laughs> i can guarantee you that's us. the case um, yeah so uh, you know why is it important to developers to have this level of of, of historical accuracy or or recreation if the vast majority of players don't really care about it. Do you think players like to know it's there, even if they're not interested themselves? Yes. I think it, it's, it gives like the, the, the illusion of historicity and, and kind of gravitas of history of, oh, look, there's a bunch of historical stuff in here, so it must be real. Um, rather than, you know, actually, I, I can't read this. Um, it's written in Italian, so it could, you know, it could be advertising cheese for all I know. But it looks like a propaganda poster and sounds like a propaganda poster and squawks cheese like a propaganda, propaganda. poster. Yeah. Um, and therefore, oh, it's history. It's you know, what I would expect to see in a museum. Yeah, I, I, this, this idea about fulfilling expectations is very interesting because on the one hand, as a player, you want to be surprised by something new and fresh, but you don't want to be too surprised. You want it to also look sufficiently what in line with what you expect, right? Yeah, you you want it to reinforce rather than challenge to an extent, which is you know a problem that games have. It's also a problem that museums have. Mm. Of you know, to what extent are they giving the public what they want versus giving them something shiny and new? Well, the Italian, um, certainly the Italian gaming public has been very enthusiastic about this, which I think is quite interesting. I've been just reading a bit of Italian reactions compared to sort of generic other internet people. Um, and a lot of Italians are, are very excited, really just to see Italian military culture represented on the screen, I think. Um, I think that feels new. And there's definitely a perception that compared to the Italian parts of Battlefield 1, this is a much more historically accurate representation well i mean the, the battlefield one bit you basically end up as italian terminator <laughs> um which you know is fun but 
I don't know. Yeah, for um, our audience members who don't know, uh, Battlefield 1 included a mission set in the Italian Alps where you were basically left to put on, um, like Chris mentioned, a Terminator suit, uh, you know, kind of a battle suit of armor and wading into trench warfare uh, as a, a First World War Italian Terminator. And then you summoned in what, what I, th- I think have been the entire combat strength of the Italian Air Force <laughs> to support you as well. Both planes. Wait, <laughs> there were at least three. <laughs> um, yeah, but there's a sense among Italians that this is in some way more respectful because it's more accurate. Both of those words in like massive scare quotes, but... Um, but because this is perceived as as particularly accurate, it's seen as as almost kind of paying homage to people's real sacrifice, which I think is a very interesting idea. A lot of people going, "Oh, my great grandfather was killed in the war, so I'm going to go and play this now," which, when you unpick that a bit, is quite strange. <laughs> Well, a lot of those kind of 1990s, 2000 games, um, you know, the ones that all produced, redid uh, Second World War games, like, you know, varying forms of Saving Private Ryan, all largely kind of played on that. Oh, you know, the opening 20 minutes of Saving Private Ryan was horrible, and my grandfather stormed the Normandy beat Sears, and yeah, why don't I play that? Because that, that, that looks like a laugh, and it'll be horrible, and it'll be awful, but it'll be engaging. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, and... You know, I know they've put a lot of work into this game, and oh, Chris got me again. Um, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was I was manning my machine gun post, and I was taken out. You were shooting me with your machine gun, and it was kind of a, a me or you situation. I fear. Uh, it should have been machine you. gun posts are really hard. Like you're stuck there, like a sitting duck. Yes, yes. It's quite dangerous. Um, I can't remember what I was saying. I I think, uh, you know, on the one hand, it is a little disappointing that the historical material that's here is not made plainly obvious to the player um, but on the other hand if you are somebody who is playing this game a lot it could draw you into perhaps picking up one of Vanda's books um, or <laughs> four, four or five copies of Vanda's or books or four or five copies of Vanda's books so you don't you even know. have to read them. You could just buy them. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, on the one hand, it's like, oh, this, it is a little disappointing that the kind of historical material sure. that we're interested in is not kind of front and center. But at the same time, if you do have a player who is really into this, then perhaps, um, you know, that leads them, you know, perhaps it's like a gateway drug uh, into historical <laughs> study. That's that's the hope. I don't know if it's an actuality, but that's that's a hope that I, I mean, often express. At the very least, I no longer have people saying to me, are you sure you mean the First World War? Was Italy even in that? You know, people are now beginning to remember that, yeah, Italy was. Or at least, you know, young male gamers now know that Italy was in the First World War. Um, I, I have seen, even just since the Italian parts of Battlefield 1, I got much less of this sort of surprise in class. Like a number of students would always say, oh, yeah, I've, you know, I've seen some of it, you know. Um, just a generic awareness of some facts about the front uh, that it existed for example Mm -hmm. has definitely come about right and generally only get that disbelief from me now (laughs) (laughs) this is all shots fired shots fired (laughs) this is all just a sort of fantasy land chris yeah i don't don't vivid fantasy land western western front supremacy going on here um So it looks like we've got a carton of cigarettes here. Uh, we've got uh, some guns. We've got the the call box. And then over here, some more playing cards and a pipe. Um, so, Vanda, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, in your kind of time as an instructor or, or being involved in public history projects, you know, how often is the case that games like this come up? And do you get ever get an opportunity to incorporate those into the classroom? Uh, what is What's your experience um, been like? Yeah, they, they come up a bit. Um, I'm so bad at first-person shooters that I'm reluctant to do too much <laughs> incorporating that directly. But I have actually taught using Valiant Hearts, um, which is a, a very different kind of First World War game um, and one that I felt 
confident enough that most people would be able to handle that I actually assigned it as a as a compulsory text, if you like, for the class. I have a course on um, popular memory and history. Um, and so we all played Valiant Hearts and we read lots of things by Chris and, um, uh, so and then, they wrote, <laughs> then they wrote papers. Um, so I, I try to incorporate it because um, I think a lot of instructors uh, work with movies and TV mm-hmm. as a way into thinking about memory and representation and national narratives and things like that. And I don't see why we shouldn't also use uh, video games in that same way. Perfect. Wow. That's that's exactly what I think as well. I'm sure Chris agrees. Chris, what do you? What about your experience? You know, instructing historical memory projects, uh, public history work. What has the past few years, past decade, been like with First World War games in particular? So, um, just over a year ago, I was teaching online because it was the the pandemic. A bunch of um, Canadian students in Canada. Um, and designed an entirely in kind of enclosed First World War and computer games course, um, which was a lot of fun. And we do, you know, assigned games and bits and pieces like that. But, um, oh, that hurt. I just got horribly killed. Um, what I found interesting for it was, you know, I, there were definite subsections of, of students who were aware of the games and are already playing the games and doing things like that. And those who, who were, you know, interested in the concept, but, you know, not necessarily super keen on spending a lot of time um, in a first-person shooter mm-hmm. game, learning the learning the ropes and the like. Um, what's made it or computer games an awful lot easier to assign as you know core texts or I don't know reading's kind of the word the go-to word, but it's not quite right, is it? Um, is the fact that computer games and YouTube go very much hand in hand? Yes. So you can yeah. you know I have assigned playthroughs you know if you don't want to play the game um you know games are expensive as well watch this youtube video of this particular you know the dolomites mission from battlefield one or or similar um you know what do you see what can the players do what you know what what's the setting like um and then you know we'll discuss it in we'll discuss it in class and i think that's almost becomes you know the solution to technology is technology Mm -hmm. um but it's just a different form of technology um, through like a YouTube playlist or, or something like that. But I think a lot of us in in kind of historical game studies have, you know, been fighting the good fight of people basically saying, why does this matter? Why should I care? Um, to the point when, well, you could say that about almost anything now. There, you know, there is enough material on First World War computer games and enough First World War computer games or enough historical computer games to make it, a, you know, a, a, a conceptual source just like anything else. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think that um, I would say in the last decade, I've seen a real shift in how colleagues view this, colleagues who might initially have been quite sceptical um, uh, and who now don't seem to blink an eye when you say this is what you're doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I... Uh... I did want to point out we have one of uh, the dead horses up here, uh, just past the, uh, just past this machine gun nest. Uh, I was wondering about this. Like they used a lot of horses, especially in the high mountains. They would have been using mules, not horses. And mm-hmm. I don't know how many. This is horrible. It's inside they're all coming out. Yeah, it's really disgusting. It's, it's gruesome. Right? Yeah, I wasn't um, going to linger on it. I don't know it. how many dead horses there would be lying around in the very high mountains, but you know. Oh, so here we've got a homestead. Hopefully, someone's it won't get home. Shot. Here we go. Try to survive and run through this as quickly as possible. This is behind enemy lines, so uh, got to be careful. I am dying constantly to the same machine gun nest. <laughs> And then uh, there we go. Derelict uh, machine gun nest inside of a home. Here, let me see if I could jump over to the other house, just very quickly, and hopefully not get shot. Let's just run in here. There we go. Oh, this looks the exact same. I think it's the exact same setup. <laughs> um, but- so what people are probably not thinking about when they're running in and out of these homesteads is the fact that you know there's a huge number of displaced civilians, for example, mm. from. Uh, these battlefield areas there there's all these you know if you actually stop and think about it you could dig deep into lots of quite interesting historical topics that 
I think most people are, are not going to stop and do, obviously. Mm-hmm. But um, it is interesting seeing this things like the interior decoration. They put the, the crucifixes on the wall, for mm-hmm. example, which I think is a, a nice touch. It definitely feels like an Italian home. Well, uh, hopefully uh, that shows that you've sort of bought into Italian uh, propaganda that this is all part of the Italian <laughs> homeland and should be liberated from the oppressive Austrians. There right? we go. This is frontline propaganda <laughs> through the game. Yep. This, it's definitely working. It's definitely working. All right. So uh, any kind of final thoughts here? I, I don't know if we'll get to the end of this battle, um, but uh, any kind of lasting impressions. Of, uh, Chris, why don't you go first? Um, it's uh, it's pleasing to see something like firstly just that this exists. Um, yeah. you know, I can I can joke about you know Italy in the first report being a being a strange fantasy, but the fact that Black Mill Games have gone for done Western Front makes sense as a starting point out to the Eastern Front and now to the Italian Front shows. Uh, oh, well done! Gotcha um, again. God, you absolutely murdered me. Um shows that you know they wouldn't be doing this if the audience didn't exist yeah and that was one of the big questions during the centenary is how long what's the lifespan for this um you know is this a passing fad or is this something more is it going to be something that's that's lasting and the fact that you know we're we're here playing is on so makes me very curious for if they're going to keep on keep on doing these Mm -hmm. um and kind of hopeful that they'll keep on doing these because you know, as long as the audience is there, presumably they'll keep making the game. Mm-hmm. And Vanda, from your perspective, uh, ex- um, expert on the Italian front during the First World War, <laughs> it, uh, does this game leave you excited? What What are the kind of lasting thoughts for you? Yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, uh, I looked on uh, Black Mill's social media today, and there's uh, there's gamers doing fan art of. Italian First World War soldiers. This isn't something I thought I would ever see. <laughs> um, you know, that's amazing. It's it's extraordinary. And as I say, it's not very long ago that that nobody out, outside of a very narrow group of people in the wider world outside of Italy mm-hmm. sort of was aware of the, of the Italian front at all, which is insane if you think that at least six hundred thousand people are killed there uh, on the Italian side gotcha, alone. Um, <laughs> so. And most of them were Chris, it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I in that sense, yeah, in that sense, I think it's it's great. I think there's a lot to think about and with in this game in terms of how they're using history, what the effect is of the, the historical elements. I find very interesting. Um, one of the, the main takeaways seems to be you die all the time, and I wonder if mostly Chris, but Chris, everyone Chris dies all the, the time. Chris is very much the known soldier here. Yeah. (laughs) What I'm wondering about this is, does this give you, does this play into that kind of futility, the inevitability of death Mm -hmm. on the battlefield? Mm -hmm. Does this suggest that the Italian theatre is even more this kind of inevitable slaughter in some ways? Yeah. Um, Which I find very interesting. Great point. Okay. Well, I I think on that excellent point, uh, we'll leave it there. So, uh, Vanda, Chris, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of History Respawn. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You'll uh, you'll have my compensation claim in the post. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Bye. And uh, Bye. to our audience, thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you are interested in more History Respawn content, please travel to historyrespawn.com. Is that Chris? See, it is. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was reloading. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you come with the king. You best not miss. Um, <laughs> I missed repeatedly. <laughs> uh, and if you really enjoy our work, please consider uh, contributing to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history response. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>